Hi, I'm Pastor David Wendell, Assistant to the Bishop for Ministry and Ecumenism in the North American Lutheran Church. This is my sermon for the fifth Sunday of Easter, May 7th, 2023. The Gospel readings from the Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 14. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Facing his own death, our Lord said to his disciples, Let not your hearts be troubled. And yet many human beings... Many of us come face to face with death and can't help being troubled and afraid. Whether it's the impending death of a a loved one or the shadow of death creeping closer and closer to me, many mortal beings find themselves questioning and struggling as the end of earthly life draws near. That's true today, just as it was true for the disciples gathered in that upper room with Jesus at the Lord's Supper the night before his crucifixion and death. Our gospel reading today is part of the so-called farewell discourses in which Jesus speaks honestly and openly with his closest followers about his own approaching death on the cross. But far from just speaking about his own death, he also talks with them about their own lives and fears, trying to prepare them for what was to come the next day when they would see their beloved Lord and Master hung on a cross, beaten and bloody, to die. That Maundy Thursday evening, they still had little understanding of what was coming tomorrow when Jesus must suffer and die. Oddly enough, Jesus refers to his own death in the farewell discourses as his glorification, as he said. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and in him God is glorified. And how strange it seems to us that that Jesus would tell the disciples that his own death would be a glorification of him and his Father. Perhaps those first disciples were wondering, How can a shameful, untimely death be in any way 
a glorification. Or maybe they weren't thinking that profoundly. They were there simply asking themselves how they were going to continue after Jesus was gone. All we know about the response of the disciples is that they were troubled. Troubled by what Jesus had been saying. Troubled by Jesus' own words about his sacrificial death. Troubled, as the disciples indicate, that they wouldn't be able to go with Jesus. Troubled, as Jesus says, that far from faithfully following him on the way to the cross, Peter would, in fact, deny the Lord, not once, not twice, but three times before the cock would crow in the early morning hours of Good Friday. As death approached, those first disciples, those trusted, hand-picked followers of Jesus, sat at table with him, and they were confused, and they were bothered, and afraid of what would happen to Jesus and them on the next day. Which is why Jesus takes a moment at the Monday Thursday Supper to deal with their troubled hearts and minds. As his own death drew near, he was concerned not for himself, it seems, as much as for his beloved disciples. Which is why he said, let not your hearts be troubled. And then Jesus said this. This is how you can keep your hearts from being troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he gave them a glimpse and a promise that was meant to give them hope. As Jesus continued saying, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And did this help the disciples? Did this give them hope? Did these words of the Lord calm the fears and anxiety of the disciples so that they were at peace and faced death with courage and confidence? From what comes after in the Gospel of John, it would seem not. But maybe this counsel of Jesus was intended not so much for, for Good Friday, but for what would come after Jesus' crucifixion and death, but also after his resurrection and ascension in the days and years and generations to come. For just as the disciples were troubled by Jesus' coming death and departure, we are troubled, and we struggle with the reality that Jesus seems to have departed from us as well. Just as the disciples were troubled by Jesus' seeming absence after his death, we continue to be troubled and to struggle with what seems at times to be Jesus' distance from us now that he is not only risen, but ascended. Sadly, though we have Jesus' own words of comfort and promise, though we know that death was not the end for Jesus, but merely the beginning of his new life after death, though we have the assurance of life with him in that place that he has prepared for us in the Father's house, still, still we are troubled at times in life, and sometimes we're troubled as death draws near. And how do we humans deal with our troubled hearts? How do we today make peace with the reality of death? I see three ways that people deal with death. First, we try to ignore the reality of death altogether. People today spend lots of money, time, and energy trying to reverse the effects of aging in the hope that by looking younger, they will have discovered the fountain of youth and warded off death. People today live as if they will live forever, and we seem to convince ourselves of that. Being surprised when illness or tragedy strikes and we're smacked in the face with the fact that death will come to us all. For in spite of our efforts at turning back time, despite our attempts at clinging to youth and vitality, we all die sooner or later. 
so ignoring death doesn't seem an effective solution. Second, people try to deal with death by trying to make what comes after more palatable. Part of the reason, surely, that people are troubled by death is that they're troubled by the prospect of what might follow. Thousands of years of Christian tradition following the word of Scripture teaches that what comes after is a judgment, a final judgment, and after that, a separating of sheep from goats as those who belong to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are taken to the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, while those who have rejected the true God go to a place of eternal death and punishment. And because that possibility of, of judgment and, yes, hell is so frightening, it seems the way some deal with it is by thinking, we can just close down hell altogether. We can do away with God's wrath and judgment so that there'll be no need for a place called hell. This is apparently the reason for books like Love Wins that denies the existence of hell because after all the reasoning goes, God's love will win out and even those who have rejected and denied him will be reformed or transformed so that all will finally receive a room in the Father's mansion regardless. And besides, since the modern mind assumes that all religious paths end up at the same heavenly street address, why would there be any judgment or separation of the saved from the unsaved? So no need to fear death when it comes, for what comes after will be, will be just all right for everyone, right? Wrong. For the problem with that way of dealing with death, it doesn't jive, it doesn't line up with God's word and God's truth and more than 2,000 years of Christian preaching and teaching. The problem with this way of dealing with death is that it, it really twists biblical truth so that you might as well do away with the Bible altogether if you're going to do it such damage and injustice. Which, by the way, is what many people today are doing. When the scriptures teach something contrary to what they believe or are comfortable with, all too many, even Christians today, throw it out, preferring instead what they hear from the voices in their heads or the emotions in their hearts. But as scripture says, God will not be mocked. God will not have his word so dismissed and twisted. Ultimately, God's word will hold and what God's word teaches will come to pass, whether we like it or not. Which is why the third way of dealing with death and life is the only way that is sure and certain, for it's the way the Lord Jesus himself offers. It's the way that Jesus himself is, as he is the way, the truth, and the life that leads you to the Father and to the Father's house. And then, interestingly, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but by me. And could the Lord have been any more clear or unequivocal than that? He doesn't say that there are many ways to the Father or to his mansion in heaven. He doesn't say that there are many versions of truth, so pick the one you like. The Lord doesn't say all paths lead to heaven. He says, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. He puts an exclamation mark on it when he says, no one comes to the Father but by me. So believe in me, says Jesus. Believe in me and you will see the Father, for I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Believe in me, says Jesus, and your heart will be untroubled and at peace. Believe in me, says Jesus, and you need not fear death or what comes after. Believe in me, says Jesus, and neither death nor life will keep you from the Father or the Father's kingdom. Which is good news as we suffer and struggle 
as we face trial and testing in life. Yes, as we come face to face finally with death ourselves. It's good news as we see Stephen in our first lesson, ready to be stoned, facing certain death when he gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus at the right hand of God the Father so that death came to Stephen as nothing more than falling asleep. Similarly, many of us remember the faithful witness of the final words of Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer on his way to the Nazi gallows with a noticeable peace and calm as he said, this is the end, but for me, it is the beginning of life. This is the good news that strengthened and encouraged these great Christian witnesses. And it's the same good news that gives you and me today courage, not just for dealing with and facing death with confidence and hope, but the good news, really the great news that emboldens us for the living of life fully and faithfully every day. As St. Peter says in our second lesson, but you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have this good news so that we may proclaim the wonderful deeds of Jesus who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light that his light and immortality may be shared with more and more people who are living in darkness and the shadow of death so that his light and immortality may free those who are living in fear, may free those whose hearts are indeed troubled that that all may one day come to him who is our light and our salvation. So Peter says, come now to him, to that living stone rejected by men, and like living stones be yourselves built into a spiritual house that together we can declare his wonderful deeds. Now, he says, now, you have received mercy. Now you are God's people. Now you are to be his witnesses. So, so now let not your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid, but proclaim the marvelous deeds of him who has called you in baptism to be his royal priesthood, to be his holy nation to be God's own people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.